Hey, Retcon Raider here, and welcome to the semi-scripted retrospective for the first quarter of 2022. That's right, we're uh, we're sticking with quarterly for now. It just feels right. As I've already said the uh, last couple times around, we're almost five years into this whole YouTube thing, so it's just not it's just not as exciting or or interesting to focus on the minutia of the month-to-month -month analytics, especially not during the uh, slower periods like this one, because, yeah, we're, we're still trying to break out of the annual Q1 slump. That said, uh, as always, the, the important thing is that even during these slower months, we're, we're still making gains. As I've said before, I, I would be a lot more concerned if we ever hit the point where we were actively losing numbers, uh, subscribers, I suppose, from one month to the next. That would probably mark the point where the channel was officially on its way towards unsustainability. But we're uh, not quite there just yet, so nothing to worry about, I think. I will say, there are a couple of reasons for the current slump, the most obvious one just being that it is that time of year. Granted, we're, uh, we're having a little more trouble than I remember uh, breaking out of that Q1 slump than I think we, we usually do. But I think a large part of that is also just because we haven't hit any big releases recently. That's usually what shakes us loose. I'm not sure exactly when that might end up happening, uh, especially with the recent decision to cancel E3 this year. Like it or not, uh, that tended to be one of the biggest hype generators for the Q2 and Q3 release cycles. Even ignoring that, I'm not really sure if there are any games on my current watch list that I would really consider hype-worthy. At least not compared to stuff like Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous or, or Wasteland 3. Maybe Marvel's Midnight Suns? Paraxis does still have some clout behind it, despite a few missteps with XCOM Chimera Squad. Then again, we, we also don't really have a solid release date behind Midnight Suns just yet. It's been pushed back a couple of times now. Hard to build hype when you have no real idea what to expect or, or when to expect it. I suppose Jagged Alliance 3 is also somewhat hype-worthy, but again, we, we just don't really have any idea what it's going to be like, or when it's coming out. It's uh, also a franchise that's probably best known for hitting its peak like 20 years ago with Jagged Alliance 2, and uh, maybe five or six botched attempts at a series revival since. But yeah, ignoring the uh, relatively tame release list we're looking at for 2022 so far, there's also your usual nonsense with, with YouTube shuffling things around behind the scenes. I'm not entirely sure exactly what they're doing, but something has clearly changed. A lot of my numbers do seem lower than they would normally be this time of year, but they are holding pretty steady, and at the same time I'm generally still making about the same amount of ad revenue. I have heard some rumors that it's because they now value watch time over total views essentially rewarding binge-worthy content creators over creators who make clickbait? That, uh, that actually does jive with a few other things I've been seeing recently, too. For one thing, YouTube seems to be moving on from their, from their uh, recent experiment with short-form content, the whole YouTube shorts thing that was, that was pretty clearly intended to compete with TikTok. They're not outright ending it, but they've stated it will no longer be monetizable, so... So yeah, you're, you're not going to be seeing people with much incentive to keep creating that sort of content. More telling, though, is that uh, I have recently started seeing the return of episode numbers and thumbnails. I mean, obviously, I never stopped using those myself, but, but it was just kind of an accepted norm for a lot of bigger gaming channels to pretend they didn't exist, because higher episode numbers tend to frighten off impulse viewers. But uh, now... Now that they want to push binge-worthy content, it's suddenly a whole lot more important to lure viewers in with the promise of a 10 or a 20 or, or even a 50-plus part series. I uh, suspect that's just the most visible sign of YouTube's recent push for serialized long-format content, because uh, I've also noticed a small but noticeable uptick on engagement for a lot of my older videos. That, I think, is a large part of why, even though I'm technically seeing lower numbers on my newer stuff, it does make me wonder, if I roll out a new Wrath episode, for example, if YouTube is checking to see if a viewer has watched the previous episodes when deciding whether to recommend it or not. If they haven't, then maybe YouTube is recommending the first episode of that playlist instead of the most recent. Again, that would, uh, that would help explain some of the recent analytics I've been seeing. 
Obviously, this is a lot of conjecture on my part, since YouTube does still tend to keep their moves and methodologies cloaked in perpetual shadow, but uh, I am somewhat encouraged, even if it does make my numbers look uh, slightly more anemic than I'm used to. Of course, uh, I suppose it's also worth noting that I have been doing some weird random games lately. Wrath of the Righteous is probably the strongest and most consistent series I'm running right now, but uh, I've been supplementing it with a lot of oddball stuff over the past couple of months. Scarlet Hollow, Strange Horticulture, Wildermyth. We've also got a potential return to Celasta looming on the horizon. Plus more Wildermyth and uh, maybe, maybe a return to Phoenix Point? That's still on the table. But yeah, uh, a lot of the uh, things I've been doing lately are impulse projects. Both Scarlet Hollow and Strange Horticulture were completely unplanned. I just happened to play them in my spare time and ended up enjoying them so much that I wanted to share them with y'all. It's, uh, it's actually been kind of refreshing, just sort of jumping into random games that catch my fancy, and then doing a half dozen episodes or whatever before moving on to something else. I mean, look, while I do love grand, lore-rich CRPGs like Wrath and Wasteland 3, it can get a little stifling when I'm plotting out my production schedule for a month, and it's just the same two series stretching out to infinity with, with no end in sight. Back when I first started the channel, I was all over the place. I would talk about, like, 30 different games a year. But uh, looking at my playlist for 2021, we literally only talked about five different games last year. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying I don't want to do long-term projects anymore. I mean, obviously, we're still pretty firmly entrenched in Wrath of the Righteous. But uh, I do like the idea of doing more random side projects just to uh, help change things up from time to time. That's actually something my uh, new upload schedule is intended to help facilitate. You may have noticed that over the past few months I've been sticking pretty closely to a new upload format, a new episode every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for our main ongoing stuff, and then random bonus slots every couple of weekends for just whatever happens to catch my fancy or, or needs to get done. In this case, it's an overdue quarterly retrospective, but uh, but I like to imagine it'll it'll usually be something a little more interesting than this. Some random new game or demo that just caught my eye, or some new lore project that just happened to get stuck in my brain. I mean, that's a great place to slot the sporadic Van Buren stuff that I still like to tinker with from time to time. I am still working on that. I am uh, currently tinkering with a script for the Bomb Station 1 stuff, but it still needs a fair amount of work before I'm ready to move forward with it. Anyway, I think I uh, went off on like seven different tangents there, but you get the idea. I feel like things were getting a little stagnant last year, and despite the numbers, Q1 was a, uh, a really nice change of pace. I'm digging it. I'd kind of like to keep that going for a while, Wrath dominating the primary production slot, but more short or medium format content rotating in and out of the secondary production slot, or going into those random weekend bonus slots. Slightly more varied content, you know? And uh, more excuses to peek in on weird, random games that I might not normally have time for. Just a, just a thought. That said, uh, moving on, uh, I'm, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and just sort of gloss over the whole teeth thing. I feel like I've already touched on it plenty over the past six months. But, for those of you who are just joining us, um, I got the, I got the Bruxism. Didn't catch it early enough, cracked a few teeth, and now here I am, down a few grand and with like 12 robot teeth. As, uh, as expensive and unpleasant as it was, it wasn't actually all that bad. It, it's mostly behind me at this point, and it was certainly preferable to that time I pinched a nerve in my spine and got laid up for a couple of months. That was, that was no fun. And I didn't even end up with a better spine afterwards. At least with the teeth, I'm now a second-rate James Bond villain. One thing I will note, though, is that Kaiser, cute, lovable Kaiser, was apparently feeling so sympathetic that he decided to knock one of his teeth out, too. Or, um, you know, maybe he just bonked his face during one of his random Kaiser-style hijinks and knocked his uh, right fang loose. I'm honestly still not sure how he managed to do that, or, or where his fang ultimately ended up. I have to imagine it's still around the house somewhere, because goodness knows it's, it's not in his mouth. I will say, though, he, he's actually taking it pretty well. 
uh, when I first noticed that he had desocketed his fang, that it was just sort of hanging out of his jaw. I, I freaked out a bit, but he just took the whole thing in stride. If anything, he was uh, more annoyed by me constantly poking his face than he was by the, uh, the, the loose fang. In my defense, though, you, uh, you never really think about how long a cat's fang really is until something like that happens. It was very weird seeing one fang that was suddenly twice as long as the other. Uh, long story short, haha, too late. I uh, did take him to the vet, and they basically confirmed that it was the result of some sort of sudden blunt trauma that had just completely knocked the tooth loose, as opposed to any sort of enduring gum or jaw problems. They told me that it was basically just hanging by a ligament and offered to essentially just pop it loose and plug up the hole. There was no saving it at that point. I did uh, go ahead and schedule to have it done, but then that same night, Kaiser went and just completely lost the fang himself. Uh, I popped him back over to the vet again, and aside from a cursory inspection and some antibiotics, they they didn't seem to think there was anything else to be done. So that was that, I guess. Kaiser is now Kaiser One Fang, and it doesn't seem to have slowed him down any. I was pretty fussy about checking for infections the first few weeks after that. Again, much to his annoyance. But he seems fine. The hole has mostly closed up. He's still eating and playing and chomping on random objects. So I guess that's the best I can hope for. But yeah, yeah, that's uh, pretty much the most exciting thing that's happened outside of YouTube over the past few months. For me personally, there's... There's a lot of other stuff going on in the world right now, but uh, I'm not, I'm not going to, we're not going to talk about that. Anyway, let's uh, move on to what has become an enduring staple of these retrospectives, the retcon radar. Again, I am still somewhat tempted to just go ahead and turn that into its own separate series, but I'm not sure how sustainable it would be. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy just keeping it super casual for the time being. I'm basically just rolling down my watch list, picking out a few highlights, and sharing some pretty off-the-cuff thoughts and observations. It's, uh, it's a very different feel, a lot more stressful even, when I'm trying to formulate my thoughts for an actual dedicated overview or something, you know? Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into it. Let's chatter about some of the random games that have recently caught my eye. Starting with an odd one, Beacon Pines by Hiding Spot and Fellow Traveler. This is an interesting one. I've had it recommended a few times, but I'll admit I was, uh, I was kind of dragging my feet on playing the free demo because, despite the lovely visuals, it does kind of look like something aimed at a pretty young audience. What, uh, what ended up raising my eyebrow, though, was that the devs for Scarlet Hollow were among the folks I saw suggesting it, and as we've seen with Scarlet Hollow, that's, that's another game where things look all warm and fuzzy until they are suddenly very much not. In looking closer at the promo material for Beacon Pines, they do in fact list it as a horror game. They even have a pretty modest warning in the demo stating that it has darker themes and mild profanity. It's described as kind of a casual, warm and fuzzy coming-of-age story set in a backwoods town where a mystery is afoot. But that really undersells it. In, uh, in playing the demo, which I might do a video on later, I'm, I'm undecided there. But uh, in playing the demo, the story is cute and saccharine right up until it is decidedly not. There was more death and dismemberment in this story than I was really expecting. And the demo leaves off on some pretty big cliffhangers that, that do legitimately make me curious about where it's all going. I don't want to jump into spoilers too much, just in case I do decide to make a video about it, but uh, I will say that the gameplay is kind of a fusion of classic point-and-click adventure and visual novel, with a pretty unique sort of Mad Libs mechanic that you use to influence the main narrative events, which they call turning points. As you explore and interact with other characters, you'll discover charms, special words that you can then slot into those turning points changing how those key narrative events actually resolve. Well, that is kept relatively simple at first. The, uh, the entire first chapter is essentially a, a glorified tutorial. The demo runs out to about midway through chapter three and lays the groundwork for what looks to be a pretty sprawling spider web of branching paths. A uh, particularly interesting aspect there is that the player can freely go back 
and revisit earlier narrative crossroads and make different decisions to see where those would have led them. And in some cases, the player won't actually unlock certain keywords until they've explored a different dead-end path. And yeah, yeah, some of those paths can get shockingly dark, especially when contrasted with the game's charming presentation and, and cutesy art style. The safety of the main character and his friends is by no means guaranteed, and some of your choices can end up having pretty dire or, or even fatal consequences. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. This is an intriguing one. I might circle back to it in the future. The devs are being cagey about the exact launch date, but they're apparently aiming for some time in Q2, so not too far out. There's a free demo available on Steam, which I would wholeheartedly recommend. Moving on. Next up, since we're already on the subject of cutesy talking animals, we've got uh, The Black Pepper Crew by... Um... Queegee Pixel? I don't know. I don't know if I have that right. This one's uh, this one's a bit more of a conventional turn-based strategy light sort of game, at least from uh, what little I've seen of it. The player takes control of a ragtag group of urban bounty hunters in a world populated by colorful cartoon critters. It actually really tickles me that this, despite having an overtly heavier theme, is so much more light-hearted than uh, than Beacon Pines. There's a lot of what you would expect from this one. Bounty hunts are semi-procedurally generated with randomized elements for extra challenge and replayability. The core crew consists of four preset characters, each with their own special abilities, but the player can also encounter and potentially recruit an increasingly eclectic cast of additional bounty hunters over time. The combat mechanics seem pretty straightforward. The fights take place on medium-sized maps with a colorful square-based grid. You've got a basic inventory system, which seems to stress strategic use of consumable items, and there seems to be a fair amount of focus on basic staples like knockback and flanking. Pretty standard stuff with a uh, fun and colorful setting. I like the look of this one. Uh, I don't think it's going to be particularly deep, but I do think it looks like a lot of fun. There's no hard release date on it just yet, but there is a regularly updated demo over on Itch.io for folks who want to get an early peek at it. After that, we've got Death Roads Tournament by the Knights of Unity. This one's another fairly unique take on your classic roguelike deck builder. This time focused on turn-based tactical death racing in post-apocalyptic America. It's a, it's a concept I'm actually really fond of. I basically grew up on stuff like Joe Deaver's Freeway Warrior and Steve Jackson's Car Wars. While I do think that deck builders are kind of overplayed, this one looks like it's pretty promising. It's apparently a video game adaptation of a deck building board game that was successfully crowdfunded just last year. Combat takes place on a simplified tactical grid with movement and combat resolution being based off of modular car components, tactical actions, and a hand curated deck of action and equipment cards. The player earns cash and equipment upgrades as they, they make their way from one race to the next with the ultimate goal of winning the grand prize, a chance to live in one of the few quote-unquote safe settlements left in post apoc America. In uh, true roguelite fashion, death means death. Your campaign comes to a premature end, but with the chance of unlocking extra options for subsequent playthroughs. Again, probably not the deepest turn-based tactical game on my list, but uh, still one that looks like it would be a great way to kill an afternoon. I'm actually pretty bummed I missed the crowdfunder because the uh, board game looks like exactly the sort of thing I'd love to have on my shelf. But the, uh, the video game looks to be a decent consolation prize. No word on exactly when this one's coming out, though uh, the devs are teasing at an impending early access launch. I do notice that the physical board game is slated to hit shelves around Q4 of this year, so it might be fair to assume that the video game will be hitting some sort of launch around that same time. Next up, we've got Goblin Stone by Orc Chop Games. I, uh, I like the concept on this one. It's another game with a cutesy exterior, but bleak undertones. It throws the player into a world where an overabundance of adventurers have led to most conventional monsters becoming endangered species, 
and the player is tasked with taking the reins of a dwindling goblin tribe and trying to help them turn that tide. The, uh, the actual gameplay seems to draw inspiration from a variety of different sources. Combat and exploration draws from Darkest Dungeon, with 2D maps and 5-row positional combat. The Goblin Den is presented in classic Ant Hive style, as perhaps most famously seen in the Firaxis XCOM franchise. The goblins themselves, though, are, are handled in a rather intriguing fashion. Individual goblins are just resources. You can get attached to them, but their, their upward progression is inherently limited, and every recruit is inherently disposable. To uh, truly progress in the game, the player has to guide not just their current batch of static goblins, but future generations as well. Managing the uh, genetic traits of future recruits is an integral part of the game, and recruiting members from exotic new tribes can allow for strange new abilities or hybrid classes. Goblins that live long enough to uh, actually retire can help train their replacements or unlock additional abilities or more classes, but those who die will still contribute as well via the uh, tribe's pooled ancestral magics. It's an interesting take on some classic fantasy tropes, somewhat akin to your stereotypical reverse dungeon scenario, but on a much greater scale. The game is currently in closed beta, but there's uh, also a free demo available on Steam, and full launch is slated for Q3 of this year. After that, we've uh, got a bit of a surprise. Hard West 2 from Ice Code Games and Good Shepherd Entertainment. I, uh, I have long had the original Hard West on my list of potential projects, but since it's an older game that predates the channel, I've just never really gotten around to doing anything with it. This one, uh, this one is a little unusual, though, in that it's a sequel to a game using the same publisher, but a different development team. Sadly, Creative Forge, the original developers, broke up shortly after they launched Phantom Doctrine, a different game that I have touched on in the past, but as far as I'm aware, they have nothing to do with these sequels that are currently under development. With Phantom Doctrine, I am deeply skeptical of the sequel that's currently in the works. It drops the Cold War setting and the turn-based tactical mechanics in favor of, like, a, a modern-era third-person real-time strategic stealth game? But uh, in the case of Hard West 2, they are at least retaining the turn-based tactical combat. I will say, uh, much like with post-apocalyptic death racing, I do have a pretty big soft spot for supernatural frontier westerns. Deadlands is hands down one of my favorite tabletop RPG settings, and one of the few tabletop RPGs that I still actively collect. Um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about Hard West 2, even though it's being handled by a completely new development team. I do think it lacks some of the grit and uh, the sort of surreal edge of the first game. The art does look a little more generic and bland, but that doesn't mean it looks bad. The screenshots and teaser bits showcase a lot of pretty bog-standard turn-based tactical mechanics, like you would expect in most modern XCOM likes, and it does seem to have a pretty wide range of creative tactical scenarios. I am seeing an awful lot of verticality on the teaser maps, which is uh, always nice. Suffice to say, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on this one. As much as I did like the first game, I'll admit it was, it was pretty rough around the edges. If this new sequel can build on the good stuff while also improving some of the bad, then I'll certainly be happy to give it a closer look, even if the art and storyline do, do end up feeling a little more generic. And honestly, I'm not really being fair with that either. That's, that's just my initial knee-jerk impression based on unfinished promo material. So, you know... Take my ramblings with a, a heaping spoonful of salt. That said, uh, no hard release date on this one just yet. The developers just have it listed as coming sometime later this year. Oh, and then we've uh, we've got a big one. Celesta Lost Valley by Tactical Adventures. This is the first story expansion for a game that we spent plenty of time chattering about just last year. They, uh, they did do one other expansion, Primal Calling, but that one just added new classes and build options for the already existing campaign, so I never really touched on it. Celesta is a game I had a lot of fun with. I backed the original Kickstarter and made something like 40 videos about the Crown of the Magister campaign. It's a fun mid-budget adaptation of the popular Dungeons & Dragons 5e rule set, 
with a heavy focus on handcrafted dungeons, turn-based tactical battles, and uh, simulating various aspects of a tabletop campaign. I would say that uh, Crown of the Magister's weakest aspects were probably the low-budget voice acting and the uh, linear campaign structure. Lost Valley seems to be compensating for that by dropping the voice acting and instead focusing on a more open-world, non-linear approach that will reportedly foster uh, greater replayability. And uh, to be fair, while I am actually sorry to see the voice acting go, uh, I found it charming. That's somewhat offset by the addition of new co-op multiplayer mode. You can now tackle the new campaign with up to three friends, with each player taking direct control of one of your four custom-made adventurers. That's actually a pretty huge step towards further further simulating a tabletop campaign. Whilst I am uh, too much of a hermit these days for multiplayer myself, um, I can see a lot of people having fun with that. Obviously, uh, given my own love of tabletop RPGs, even if it has been a few years since I last ran one, we will uh, likely be jumping into the new Celasta expansion sooner rather than later. Like I said, I had a lot of fun with the original campaign, and uh, I am always down for an excuse to assemble a, a barely functional party of murder hobos and toss some dice around. This one actually comes out next week, so uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, taking a much closer look at it quite soon. Okay, next we've got... Oh, actually... Actually, we are running a bit long with this, but uh, let's do... Let's do, like, two more. I picked out ten titles, but that might be a bit much considering how much time we're spending on each one. So let's, uh, let's jump down to Shadow of the Road by Another Angle Games. Um, I'll just start off by saying there's not a whole lot to go off of on this one. It looks to be a turn-based tactical RPG set in a an anachronistic version of Feudal Japan with steampunk and sorcery. I, uh, I only actually found out about it recently, and the very first thing that caught my eye was the promo art of a samurai facing off with what looks to be a steampunk Scorpitron. That alone was uh, worthy of closer inspection. That said, on closer inspection, this is actually looking to be a pretty decent tactical RPG. Promo shots seem to indicate that uh, it will use a conventional square grid with an action point and movement point based combat system. Hit point counters are kept on the low end, which does tend to make for more lethal and challenging combat scenarios. On top of that, we've got gorgeous environments with a fair amount of verticality, what look to be oversized boss units like the Steampunk Scorpion, real-time stealth mechanics with perception cones, and the ability to split your party for better scouting or pre-combat positioning. There's a lot to like here. The only real downside here is that uh, this one is apparently still pretty early in development, and there's no real info on exactly when it might hit some sort of launch. So I uh, think this one is worth keeping an eye on. They've been teasing early access since 2020, so it can't be too much longer, right? Yeah, we'll just uh, put a pin in that one. And finally, let's wrap things up with... Let's say The Pale Beyond by Bellular Studios and Fellow Traveler. That's the uh, same publisher that's also handling Beacon Pine, so I guess that sort of brings us full circle. Um, similar to Beacon Pines, this is another oddball entry on my watch list that isn't really similar to the sort of games I normally follow. This one looks to be one part visual novel and one part survival game, with the player being thrust into the role of a reluctant Victorian-era ship captain during an expedition gone horribly wrong. The general premise behind this is that your ship, the Temperance, is on an expedition to the South Pole in search of its sister ship, the Viscount, which went missing five years earlier. Something goes horribly wrong, your, your ship's original captain goes missing, and from there it falls on you to try to keep the expedition on track and the crew from each other's throats. It looks to be an intriguing mix of narrative events and survival mechanics, with the player needing to juggle food, fuel, and morale to both keep the crew alive and the expedition moving. Every member of the crew is apparently a, a unique individual, each with their own special traits and presumably their own foibles and personalities. So uh, it will be important to assign the right crew to the right tasks, while also keeping in mind whatever preferences or personality quirks they might have. 
Mutiny and morale does seem to play a fairly prominent role in the game, with the surviving crew voting on key decisions, or even a new leader if you should happen to lose their trust. Given, uh, given the nature of the game, I wouldn't be surprised if certain characters also start trying to deliberately undermine you once things start going south, in hopes of putting someone else in charge. Perhaps even themselves. I mean, we, uh, we don't know what happened to the original captain, so... So maybe it's in someone else's best interest to make sure you never find out. But yeah, yeah, this one uh, intrigues me. I've been looking at a lot more visual novels lately, and while most of them do seem pretty shallow, there are still some, like this one and Beacon Pines, and Scarlet Hollow, of course, that uh, look to have interesting stories or clever mechanics. My first love is always going to be XCOM-likes and turn-based tactical RPGs, but I also have a lot of appreciation for well-crafted and well-presented stories. This one is uh, tentatively slated for launch sometime later this year, so we might end up circling back to it. But that really, uh, that really depends on how it actually turns out. I guess we'll see. All right, I've been rambling for over half an hour now, so we should probably start winding this down. I mean, I do like rambling, but I've still got like six more video projects on my current to-do list, so I should probably wrap this one up. That said, as always, we will wrap this up with a round of thanks. I mean, uh, I would literally not still be doing this if it weren't for fine folks like you, the rank and file viewers who actually have the time and or patience to put up with my nonsense. It may not seem like much, but every time, uh, every time you watch one of my videos or comment or click that like or subscribe button, it does all add up. The channel's had its ups and downs, but it, it's thanks to folks like you that I have continued toughing it out and, um, you know, made the, the ultimate sacrifice of playing video games and sometimes talking over them. I mean, I guess there is technically more to it than that. But since when have I been the sort to toot my own horn? I'd, uh, I'd rather give the credit to you guys, so thanks for keeping me going. You are the fire in my heart, the steel in my resolve, the wind beneath my wings. The, um, insert fourth metaphor here. Your continued support helps keep this channel going, and your thinly veiled disdain keeps me up at nights. I'd also, of course, like to uh, thank the Raiders, the fine folks who help ease the financial burdens of running the channel and or remaining housed and fed and or tending to a clouder of fussy and occasionally one fanged felines. Not necessarily in that order. Seriously, though, uh, as always, even in the best of times, YouTube's whole ad rev situation leaves a lot to be desired, so, so the Raiders do really actually help keep things moving along smoothly. It's thanks to them that I can spend as much time as I do talking over games while I try to distract you from how bad I am at actually playing them. That said, let's give special thanks to the Honorary Raiders from Q1 of 2022. Alexander Hockbaum, Austin Fagan, Benjamin Gray, Bose 77, C1S, Chronosaur, Commissar Moody, Comrade Robot, CRX CRVS, Ego 2, Egon Alter, Ethan Vonderweed, Evan Prince, Flamebeard, Gresham, ICU Uwu, Maximilian Monk, Misha, Morgwen, Nine Knives, Oil of Hope, Peter, Renum, Rob H, Roman Berger, Scott Brown, Served Cold, Sir Dialot, Steve Saxa, Vertigo 322, and Victoria Babenko. I'd also like to give extra special thanks to the veteran raiders who are active in Q1. Those are the folks whose names you see splattered all over the screen during the opening segments on most of my videos. Adri Raven, Anachronian, Dracith, Glenn Jensen, Indiana Smith, James Tremere, Jeffrey McKins, Casbis, Lady Shayna, Laura and Mike, Leroy Nukinson, Lacknishender, Mark Giemza, Max Rogespierre, Michael Bain, Nerdprof, Neurolancer, Nishko, Nod Goblin Nico, OMG, Optimal 2, Raximus Savage, Sensei Yums, Sean Orpin, Stoltz, Terry Williams, The Link King, The Book Thief, and Thomas K. Arata. 
Oh, one moment. Need the uh, liquid. Ah, nourishing water. What would I do without you? Die, I guess. Oh, uh, and uh, of course, I suppose I should uh, give some token acknowledgement to the Raider Elite. Folks like Revenant, Aloise, Inert in Warpaint, Dragon Matrix 7, Eerie B23, Excelsior, Goatlabe, Kazorm, Lima, Nathan Welch Jr., Thomas Piatkowski, Trip Hop and Skip, and Valenrook. Um, I think they'd probably do stuff too, but who can say for certain? Seriously, though, uh, thanks to all of you for your continued support, the Raiders, the Raider Elite, and the rank and file viewers. That said, if you would like to join the inglorious ranks of the Retcon Raiders, then feel free to check out the links to my Patreon or PayPal down below. I'm uh, continuing to fine-tune the exact benefits of membership, but the big ones tend to be shoutouts in my videos, preferential placement on waiting lists for games like Wildermyth, or the upcoming Celasta expansion, and uh, as of Q1, early access to almost all of my new uploads. I, uh... I am also continuing to explore other potential benefits. For example, I just recently linked the Patreon tiers to my Discord server. You know, for folks who uh, want to show off their support in gaudy and sometimes hard to read colors. I'm also looking at potential custom badges or emotes, though uh, I have not yet settled on exactly what I want just yet. And um, I might even do something with uh, that whole YouTube membership program that YouTube keeps trying to push on me. You know, for the folks who can't or, or just don't want to do the whole Patreon thing. I, uh, I just need to figure out how all that works and then make sure I can actually maintain the benefits I want to offer on a consistent, ongoing basis. Easier said than done for someone who is even five years into this. Still borderline tech illiterate. Go me. Anyway, uh, I ran a little over my allotted time for plugging the Patreon. Sorry about that. So... Let us hastily bring this rambling retro to an overdue end. As always, uh, if you've got any questions, comments, or snide remarks, then feel free to leave them down in the comments below, and I'll try to get back to you. Well, I might, I might ignore those snide remarks, but I guess that really comes down to just how snide they are. Also, if uh, you were really going to leave serious snide remarks, I somehow doubt you would have made it this deep into the video. But hey, feel free to prove me wrong, I guess. It's all just video engagement, as far as YouTube is concerned. Oh, and uh, as always, you can contact me using the increasingly bewildering assortment of email and, and social media things that haunt my every waking moment. I probably keep track of those things, too. That said, thanks for watching. Kudos if you actually made it this far, and uh, I will see you next time. Redcon Raider, out. See you next time, Space Cowboy.